uh, the text will be taken, if you have your Bible, let's turn to 1 Kings 8, 27 through 30. That's what we'll be covering. I thought he wanted me to cover all 60 verses. <laughs> Whoa, we're going to be here a long time. Uh, but I did tell him that uh, this is one of my favorite passages. Um, I use, typically use the, uh, the repeat version in Chronicles, but verse 23 is key. And I was going to build a sermon around this and, and until the Lord really laid on my heart, 27 through 30. But I'm going to read verse 23. I'm taking my time, give everybody time to get there. Uh, verse 23, and then I'll read our text, 27. And he, being Solomon, said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth beneath keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. And down to 27. But will God in, uh, indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less the house which I have built. Yet I regard to, I have regard to the prayer of your, yet... I said I could read. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of which you have <clears throat> excuse me, of which you have seen my said, my name shall be there to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. Listen to the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place here in heaven, your dwelling place, here and forgive. Let's pray, please. Magnificent Father in heaven whom all the families of the earth are named, we come to you grateful that you have visited us in the Lord Jesus. And we thank you for the lesson of the temple that is before us today. We just ask that by your great grace, the Spirit will be able to move in our hearts and our minds and motivate us to understand who we are in the kingdom and our place and responsibility to King Jesus. So we lift up ourselves to you, but we lift up King Jesus to you to say, we honor him, we love him, we will serve him. We pray this prayer because of who he is and in his name. Amen. Amen. Elohim Yahweh. Okay, say it with me. Elohim, Elohim. Yahweh. Elohim Yahweh. Uh, Elohim is the God of power. It's a, it's a plural concept. Um, showing the multitude and the magnificent of this great God. And in Yahweh, I, I, you, you've probably heard it you know, various ways, but I define it as total being, absoluteness, completeness, on a personal basis. And in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Elohim, the great God, the total being, walks in the garden in the cool of the day. And in later in Exodus, it says, Yahweh, because Moses wants them to know, because he said this, and God told him, this is the name I want you to use. Yahweh came down, walks, came down, to deliver. I, I, I love the way Norm looks at this. He snatches him away, you know. And so I, I can just, if God would be like us, he would go, nee, 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 Pharaoh. but he didn't do that. At least <laughs> it wasn't written in the text. So he snatched his people from the power or the hand of the Egyptians. Yahweh's glory filled. Walks, comes down. Fills, it filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40. Then Solomon builds this magnificent house, seven years to build, that his name might be there. Are you, are you catching the idea here? The presence of Elohim Yahweh? The great God of the world, the Creator, the, the, the Father of Israel, Elohim Yahweh takes presence. Then Solomon, in, in, in our opening verse, asked, But will Elohim dwell on earth? 
He visits. He walks. He comes down. He fills. He, he, he has a place to be. But will he come down to dwell? Okay? It's a big difference. All right? A big difference. Because the others are appearances. Dwelling is to be among, to be with. And, and Solomon here, when he says this, chooses Elohim. He, he, he drops off the Yahweh, chooses only Elohim because he's already said, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. He said, there is no God like you. He's incompatible with us. You know, I, I hear and I've often said, and, and this is brief, this is not part of the sermon, we'll cut this out later. But uh, if you notice in church how often we talk about God, but we don't always mention Jesus by name as much. I have a theory as to why. You might want another theory? Yes. Oh, thank you. Chase on your <laughs> Absolutely. The reason is because God is so far away. He is so magnificent, so, so separate from us. We feel like we can talk about Him because of the separateness. It's a incompatibility, actually. Whereas Jesus is personal. Okay? But I'm going to show you more about that as we move along. So, incompatible. And Yahweh is faithful in covenant. We read that in, in, in 23. And so we get to our, our proposition, our, our, our main point. This is the one idea I want you to, uh, to take away. And I'm talking a lot until it shows up on the screen. Nope. Back up. There you go. Yahweh, Elohim, is faithful in covenant and will therefore, he must come down he must walk with, and he must fill his servant. See the red? Otherwise, can't, won't listen to us. Did you notice how many times here prayer to listen, supplications and all that appeared in these few verses? Because that's what we're going to be dealing with, and that's the, the main point, because... Why must he do it? That should be the obvious question here. Why must God do this? He is incompatible. He is separate. We are not God. We're flesh and blood. Everybody here has a time stamp on them. Right? Every one of you have an expiration date. We go through those in our refrigerators, right? I despise garbage day because my wife cleans out the refrigerator. I have hurt my back and had to go to the chiropractor more often than not because of all the garbage that gets thrown out. We have expiration dates. We all look for that. That time when we will end this life. Yahweh does not have that. And he wants to listen. So, that, so Solomon's going to give us three reasons why he wants to come down, walk with, fill his servants, and be in this position to list. First one. To regard the prayer and supplication of his servants in verse 28. Based on keeping covenant and showing loving kindness. Now, I could talk for hours just on that. I started a study of the covenant in 1975, and it has not ended. I love the covenant, and you cannot understand Jesus if you don't understand the covenant. I, I told you this, I got another book I'm working on. Um, and one of the vital points is how the cross executes a covenant for us. And the new covenant uh, demanded a death. And that death of Jesus put us in a special relationship. Well, God was there with Israel, <coughs> keeping the covenant. Now, if you notice in your text showing is how wiggly, we call it italics for those of you who have been a long time out of school. <laughs> All right, so uh, showing is not actually in the Hebrew. The word loving kindness is, it is a, a, a near indefinable concept because it had, it's so fluid, it has so many ideas. But it can be very understood very easily and completely as faithful love. Faithful love. And that's what he's, uh, that, that Solomon says, uh, Yahweh Elohim guards 
the Lord God guards his covenant is by his faithfulness. So based on that, he keeps guarding with his faithfulness. Now this concept of guard means to, to, to turn aside, to pay attention. But I love this. I found this in one of the commentators. I didn't forget to mark who. He said, face me. Face me. You ever said that to God? You ever have the nerve to say, God, would you look at me? Basically, that's what Solomon said. Why would God not look? But did he not turn his back on Jesus once? At least that's the way we kind of picture that cross scene. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did he ever turn his back on Israel? Yeah, their unfaithfulness to the covenant caused him not to, uh, to listen. Uh, he uses a concept of, of prayer. And, and, and so Solomon's saying, God, face us. Because we've got something to say to you. This word for prayer is a very common word, no different than the way we understand it in English. But supplication, I remember the first uh, time I was actually nine years old, I still remember this, we were at a church camp and we were studying prayer. We were being good kids in the dorm at night studying prayer. And I remember the, uh, the acts, acknowledgement, confession, supplication, and thanksgiving. Anybody ever heard that for, the, for a prayer formula? Right, right? You're giving your age away, ladies. You should not have admitted that. That's an old Sunday school trick, right? Right. So, and, and so we, we didn't have the resources to figure out what a supplication was. So we just figured it was asking. The Hebrew concept here is to look at mercy, a plea for mercy. It's to understand your humanness. Okay? And we're going to add something to that humanness later. And, and so you kind of put that on, on one of the back burners and let your humanness simmer because we're going to get to that again. So this, this, this idea of a supplication is listening, but it's a cry for help. Isn't that mercy? You know, what that's about? Okay, that, that cry for help. Uh, I was coming home late from work one night uh, years ago. It's around the Hardy's, two in the morning with that inventory. And uh, as I'm getting ready, I got my key in hand. I'm getting ready. I live in an apartment complex. I hear, oh, mister, help me. Get ready. Oh, mister, help me. And I see, this guy's walking toward me at a very fast pace like this. When he got to me, I could see the bone in his arm. He got mad at his girlfriend, took a swing at her. She ducked. He got a plate glass window and brought it back. He just laid himself open. So, took care of him. I was his rescue that night. This was a cry for rescue. Now, take a minute. A little Bible history here. Do you remember a time Israel cried to God? They were in Egypt, right? Things had kind of changed. They weren't living in the... You know, they, they weren't living uh, the, the Mediterranean lifestyle. I don't know if you're aware of the Goshen, where they were. is a Mediterranean area, you know. And uh, they, they were used to being out. When Joseph was around running things, they were used to being out on the beach and going out and having a good time. Well, when Pharaoh's, or when um, uh, Joseph's gone, Pharaoh comes around and says, Hey, I don't know these guys, and that's free labor. Get them. So they start crying. Brutal, uh, one of my favorite Old Testament scholars, he, he talks about this. He said that uh, they weren't crying to God. And, and I looked at the text. They weren't. There was no indication. They were just simply crying. And God heard them. Why? Because of His covenant faithfulness. These were the grants of Abraham and Jacob, the patriarch. Got that picture? It's a different word. He used a different word. This, this was a wailing. I'm hurting. And, and I just want out of here. But here, Solomon's saying, God, we're just asking you to pay attention to us. We, we've got some things on our mind and we, we want to, to pray. He says, your servant prays for you today. And, and this is the first time, and this is going to show up three times, he talks about Listen. Let me give you another word for this. In the Hebrew, Shema. Have you ever heard of the Shema? Mm -hmm. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It's the same, same, same verb. Listen. Solomon is saying to God, listen. 
It's a plea. It's a plea for mercy. It, it's, a, it, it, it's a plea to be heard by God. Now, now listen to this. Okay, you ready for this? Shema. Listen. Everybody listen? Get your attention. Okay. Here are all the meanings associated with it. Listen. I used to memorize this stuff when I was your age. I could just spout this stuff off. You notice me? I, I gotta read. Okay, listen. Listen to. Pay attention. Oh, look. Now, perceive. Anybody here ever raise children? No. Do children listen? No. Not all the time. Not all the time. Obviously, you don't even tell a child anything one time. You just have to remind them maybe times after that, right? They hear words, but do they perceive? Do they understand? Well, that's what this, this concept of the Shema, you know, holds this idea of perception, understanding, which leads to obedience. Why would God speak if He did not expect the response of obedience, of a positive response? Does that make sense to you? His speaking was not like we have done with our children in the past. His speaking was with intent, with purpose. So now he's going to throw in another term that we, we've seen through the text. Servant. Servant. Okay? And, and this is the first time it's mentioned in 18, uh, 823. And there's four different servants mentioned in 15 verses in this section. Uh, David, Solomon, of course, he calls himself a servant. He calls Israel a servant. And Moses, all of these, he's depicting this, the, these various people with various responsibilities and places in God's plan. And he calls them servants. But you got to get, and that's why I read 23. Go back to 23 and you find how he understands servants. It's the ones who walk before you, Elohim and Yahweh, with all their heart. Now, honestly, have you ever done anything half-heartedly? Did you enjoy doing something if it was half-hearted? It's not, does it? You know, we, it, there's usually something about that job. Okay, this is going to sound strange, I know, but when I was a kid, I love to do dishes. My wife, I still love to do dishes. She makes me put them in the washer. She doesn't think I get it clean. <laughs> I still wash them. Put them in the dishwasher. I love washing dishes. Mama would not let me wash the dishes. I always had to dry. So I did it half-heartedly. Okay? And you understand, you've been in that position of doing something half-hearted. Solomon Therefore, God's understanding of a ser servant or description of a servant is someone who does something with their whole heart, with all of their energy. How did Jesus say? With all your, it comes uh, with the Shema, with all your, help me out, all your, all your, all your, all your strength. Okay, depending on which gospel you read, and uh, the, the, uh, the Shema has only three of those. But uh, heart, mind, soul, strength. However, th they're looking for totality of holding back or, or not holding back, of not shorting God. So a servant is designed. And, and this heartfelt walk is based on who we are with God for us today. Now, of course, with Solomon building the temple, it was a recognition of they were elect people um, because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? We are elect people because of whom? The Lord Jesus. Still covenant, same concept, right there, the same idea. The heartfelt walk is based on, on, on the idea of covenant faithfulness. The very same description given to God. No other God like Him. Why? Because He has covenant and He's faithful to it. I, I, for the longest time, taught that, that uh, Israel's God was the only one who had land covenant with his people until the Houstons and us went to uh, Sedona, Arizona and found out that the Hopi Indians talk about a land covenant with their God. The only other tribe. And I couldn't study on this. And, and, and uh, so I tried to find out the origin of it. 
because I didn't know if it started after the Catholic missionaries went to Arizona and they learned the Bible that they then said, our God also did it. So still didn't research. Found only one book on the Hopi that has been beneficial. And this covenant, sometimes, did, okay, back to the children. Do you ever have to motivate them? <laughs> how did you motivate them? No, how? Not specifically, but generally, how did you motivate them? Either with this or that. Threats, bribes. Threats, br <laughs> threats or bribes, right. Good or, good or less than good, okay? Deuteronomy records the same thing for God. It says, see that I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing is the bride. <laughs> That's the good things. Didn't, didn't we sing? Uh, eyes are bad. I, I'm, I'm trying to find a candle. So, I know it's here. Did, didn't we sing about blessings? Didn't we sing about benefits? Well, you were here, right? I couldn't see you. There's a big thing in the way. Okay? Uh, so we sang about those things, right? Are there blessings to being a Christian? Yes. Okay? In this life. Mm -hmm. Right? We, the, the other life's not quite. We, we know about that. One. But in this life, are there blessings? Absolutely. There are always covenant blessings. Are there curses? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and that could be a whole sermon, a whole lesson <coughs> that you might want to study sometime. Hebrews 12 talks about the discipline of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul talks about the neglect at the table causes some to be weak, sick, and even dead. <coughs> and anybody know Ananias and Sapphira? Not personally, but I mean, you've heard of Ananias and Sapphira, right? <coughs> well, that was the curse of the covenant. So, all of this is, is the background for the idea of a servant coming before God with the right and authority to say, God, will you please listen to me? Will you please listen? So, we, we, we're talking about the fact that Yahweh Elohim, Elohim Yahweh, His faithful covenant, and must come down, walk with, and fill His servants. And He gives a second reason now, in uh, verse 29, and that is to open His eyes toward the house. Don't read that right. Is that what it says? Verse 29? Is that a mixed metaphor? That's like a chicken crossing a bridge. Let's see if it matches. It's one of my favorites. In other words, he's been talking about listening. What do the eyes have to do with listening? You might want to venture uh, uh, an opinion. I like conversation. Nick, what do you think? Any ideas? In 10 words or less? <laughs> Sometimes, remember what we said before? With your children, you had to say, look at me. Look at me. Remember we already <laughs> talked about that just a minute ago? Facing God. Because when you're facing the person, it's hard to ignore them. You know, my, my wife and I have a tendency to talk to each other a, a lot, but not always in the same room. <laughs> Makes listening difficult, doesn't it, dear? <laughs> yeah. So, what he's saying here is to open his eyes. He repeats this idea of listening or paying attention to you. So this is the second time it's coming up. But in the con in the context, in the context, there is a granting of a relationship, an in and an out relationship that's that, that's uh, tied up in, in, in this word in the context. In, in, and Kendall mentioned this, a throne of grace, that's the end. The out is when we leave the throne of grace, are we still allowed to draw God's attention and ask for a request? Absolutely. So here in a temple context, he's talking about access. Um, DeVry says, the purpose is that the temple must serve as a listening post or sounding board. <laughs> Continually receptive to any prayer that may be directed toward it. I think that's, that's a pretty powerful statement. Have you ever cried to the Lord because you hurt? You have a different temple, which we're going to talk about. The temple's Jesus. But this is what he said. Here's the problem. I, I know when, when Nick shared to me the purpose of all of this, <coughs> excuse me, I don't remember exactly how he said it, but something to the attendant. 
how they messed up the kingdom. Am I right on that? Okay. They took the emphasis off of the one listening and, and applied it to the temple. They began to think, because we've got the temple, we can't be touched. Well, that was kind of taken care of about, what, five something, five something, you know, when the temple was gone. So they built another one. And they think, we can't be touched. Well, Rome comes along and changes that picture again. And that's why Jesus says, next time we're going to a temple that cannot be destroyed. A temple not made with hands. So, so here he's saying, that this temple, it, it is a house of prayer. You ever heard that term? Mm -hmm. Scripturally? You ever heard that term? Where, where does it come up scripturally? Anybody know in the Gospels? Cleansing the temple. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. And uh, I, I, I picked up Mark's because Mark has an expression that Luke does not. He talks about a house of prayer for all the nations. Not just, where, whereas Luke keeps it exclusive to the, to the Israelites, he says for all the nations. Of course, that was the intent of his writing. He was showing that the gospel went beyond the, uh, the physical boundaries of Israel. And so he's saying here that, that, that this house of prayer is for all the nations. He gets that from Isaiah, where Isaiah uses three minds in 56-7. My holy mountain, my house of prayer, and my altar. Every one of those satisfied by Jesus. But then he includes, Isaiah includes, for all peoples. Thinking in the context of the covenant, your mind should race back to Genesis chapter 12, where he says that, that um, uh, the covenant will be a blessing to all the people. If you bless them, if they bless you, they will be blessed. So, uh, and here again, we pick up the term servant. Your servant shall pray. Now, a dignitary can come to a, to a king because they're on the same level. And they, they've got some agenda, some purpose. But here he's saying, and, and Solomon's making it personal here, your servant shall pray. It is because we are servants that we need to pray. Now, I, I've got to go back and remind you. Now, it's not saying you don't remember. This has nothing to do with, with short memories. But let me remind you, a servant is defined as one who walks before the Lord. How? With all their, help me, heart. 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 with all their heart, with their total being, the completeness uh, of, of the person, the fullness of the person. The praying person prays with all their hearts because they love the one they're praying to with all of their hearts, okay? So, we, we know that, that our Lord God, He is faithful in covenant, and He must come down, walk with, and fill His servants. So He's in a position to listen. And we, we said it's to give regard. The second point that we, uh, we made was to open His eyes. And now in verse 30, come to this, to listen. So we're actually getting to, to the Shema again. But he uses Shema in, in a unique way here. But he says, to listen to the supplication of his servants and his people. <coughs> shema, Shema. He uses that same verb twice. But we translate it, listen and hear. Here's the way I looked at it. God, you listen, I listen. It's, it's not going to do any good to try to pray if God's not going to listen. Does that make sense? Effective prayer. Wiseman gave us this. Effective prayer is based on God's incompatibility, <coughs> His trustworthiness to fulfill covenant, and His transcendence. The fact that He is not locked here like we are. Does that make sense? And our prayers are, are totally useless if God does not and that's why we say, please God, pay attention. Cry. And maybe your cry will be like Israel in Egypt. And, and, and you're just crying out. Kind of like the old boy who was on the roof uh, and is a little wet and lost his footing. He comes sliding down the roof and he hollers, Oh God, save me! About that time his uh, belt catches on the nail. He looks up and says, I got it this time, God, you do the next. 
next one. <laughs> but we know who we're crying to, correct? We know to whom it is that we, we want to direct in, 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 in here. Now, in, in this verse, he adds servant and the people. Now, he's already identified Israel as a servant, so he is just reiterating this idea that as a nation, okay, take it out of 1 Kings, put it in Zephyr Hills, we could say, here is servant and first church of the Nazarene. That's the way we, we, we have to hear this. He will hear when we hear, and then he asks for forgiveness. Practice forbearance, pardon, forgive. I, I really am drawn to that first concept of, pra uh, of practicing forbearance. Have you ever had to ask God for forgiveness for the same thing more than once? Yeah. His forbearance, his patience. Boy, if we would have been that patient with our kids. <laughs> <laughs> totally different story, maybe. Okay, let's, uh, let's draw this all together. Quick point there, but I want to draw this all together in a conclusion make a pretty definitive statement here about the conclusion. I teach my students that a conclusion should ask the question, so what? Hey, this was a dedication speech of a certain people in a certain historical point, and are there anyone here, anyone here of Jewish descent? Direct Jewish descent? No. So what? So what? Dedicated speech. So what? God is faithful and covenant to them. So what? Stephen's going to remind us of what, what Solomon already said in, in Acts 7 in his uh, defense state, statement when he said, God doesn't dwell in human creation. Because he made it. His transcendence, his greatness, his power. There's a very unique prayer in Hebrews chapter 10 that very few people know. Jesus is talking directly to the Father and, and, and you can tell by the language, by the structure of the sentence, he is on earth. When he says this, he says, a body you prepared for me. A body you prepared for me. Now relate that over into, my, I pull up Mark's statement here, destroy this temple. And what did he say? And we'll rebuild it, right? What was he talking about? What was the temple? His body, his own body. The necessity of the body here makes God a reality to you and I today. Because God, and, and, and this is a language I've adapted over about the last year and a half. God invades this world. We like to at Christmas talk about the baby and, you know, and the incarnation. We throw around all those churchy words. But folks, let me tell you, it was an invasion. And it seemed clandestine. Sneaking him in as a baby. <laughs> you know, that's smart. The Hebrew writer's going to say, this is so he could share flesh and blood. Now, you and I share flesh and blood, right? There's no vampires here. <laughs> okay. No, television just got scared of everybody. Let me see your teeth. <laughs> so, uh, we share humanity, like we were talking about before. We share humanness. Everyone here has an expiration date. Okay? One of us here has exceeded the normal expiration date. Okay? I will not point that lady out because she will be mad at me later. <laughs> no. But we all have the expiration date. And we share that, right? Anybody ever been second in the hospital? Oh, my favorite vacation. I would love to go to the hospital. And I'm serious. I actually can work or uh, relax and not work when you're, in a, when you're in the hospital. They make you just sit there and wait for the visits every two hours. And you get to eat it, you know, unless you're on a restricted diet like Susan just was, you know, in the hospital. Uh, you pretty much get to eat anything you want, and then your wife will sneak in extras. So for some of us, a hospital is a vacation, but generally, it's an indication something happened to the body. Okay. I, I was thinking, Nick, when we were uh, had some kind of meeting, some kind of group meeting, I, and I spoke over at, uh, um, with Dennis, mm -hmm. and I went up and had the, had the big cage yeah. on my field. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've all been there, right? We, we've broken something, got sick, or whatever. We share that humanness. But the Hebrew writer says Jesus shares differently. 
he, he used a, a different concept in the Greek. He says there was a commonality. And the reason is, he did not have an expiration date, but he chose to meet death. Often he said, there's an hour. I'm looking for that hour, that one specific time. Why? God's don't die. God had to have a body. The invasion required that He come like us in order to conquer the demons and the darkness of a kingdom opposed to everything God is. That's why it says that, that, that I use this idea of, of invasion. And this allows God to interact with us differently. Because with Israel, it was a stone tablets. It was a tent. It was smoke. It was fire. This is the way God interacted. But with us, He takes up residence in us. What a difference. What a difference. I love this passage in, in Colossians where, where it talks about a transfer into the kingdom. It, it's just the same kingdom language where he says, we have been transferred from this, this dark authority. He does, not, he does not call it a kingdom. He says a dark authority, a dark power. When we were talking about Israel and Egypt, where God snatches them, the, the Hebrew has the idea of a tight grip by Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. So I take a candy from a bag. You know? Not a thing you can do. And just recently I've come across studies that I, I, I guess I just had never been there or just my eyes weren't open. I wasn't listening. Um, that then God uh, um, writes uh, uh, Ten Commandments, nine of which oppose. <laughs> laws of Egypt. I thought that was so beautiful. Everything God did was to free them. Now, this is where we talk about redemption. Anybody ever heard the word redemption? <laughs> What's the first thing you think of, right? The price paid. Redemption is greater than the price paid. Redemption is about a change of ownership. Israel was under the grips of Pharaoh. God loosens that grip. Place, but that's okay. He loosens that grips, then he and he brings them over into the promised land. Now let's look at it differently in the language of the scriptures. They were non-status slaves of Egypt. They were just bums in Egypt. God lifted them out of that and made them servants of the most high God. What? A, that's redemption. And we have to define redemption in the in, in the new covenant the way God defined it and, and demonstrated it in the old covenant. So you have been you have been snatched away from a dark authority and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved Son. Redemption, new ownership, and then finally, as citizens, we share. Now, before we're going to talk to you about sharing flesh and blood, use a word you're familiar with or you've heard, koinonia. Anybody heard this word? That's what we share is flesh and blood. Now, Peter picks up that term and says, we koinonia, the divine nature. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. Do you possess the Holy Spirit? If you have been transferred into the kingdom because of your faith in who Jesus is, not just the fact that He died for you, but that you believe that He truly is God in the flesh and that He conquered death and sits at the right hand in the position of authority. He said, all authority given unto me. If you have made that commitment to the King, you've been, beloved, you've been transferred. And I love the way Paul said it. Kingdom of the beloved Son. Israel disappointed God. We're not. Because our devotion is to the one who is king. Let's pray. Father, what magnificent wisdom you have shown and demonstrated so thoroughly in your covenant with Israel and the potential of the covenant we have, a new covenant, the eternal covenant. 
under Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you that we can be here today and share these wonderful thoughts. Father, help us now to be committed to our great King, to be his servants, looking for his ear as he ever goes to make intercession, so that we can be better servants. We ask this because Jesus is Lord.